Okay, welcome to the Spine Conference. Um, today's discussion will be ankylosing spondylitis. Um, but before we start, I want everybody to make their predictions of who's going to win the Super Bowl. We'll start with Aaron. Aaron, what's your prediction? Houston Texans, you're Patriots, okay. Brian? Packers. Megan? Giants? David? Steelers? I was gonna I was gonna say Steelers. They are on the upwards curve trajectory. I was gonna say Steelers, but since David said it, I think I'll go with the Chiefs. They kind of upward trajectory too. Okay, so um, I like to go over real cases um, because the, it's the best way to learn. And so this is a case we just had uh, two weeks ago here at uh, Chesapeake. 59 year old man uh, who uh, whose chief complaint was mid axial thoracic back pain. Um, he had a slip and fall about a week before I saw him and um, went to Hartford Memorial Emergency Room. Uh, because he was unable to walk. Um, he could not get it. He had x-rays, which are relatively normal. Uh, and he did have a CAT scan, which showed basically a fracture. Um, he just uh, didn't do well with physical therapy, couldn't walk, couldn't move, uh, because they don't have um, uh, uh, coverage at Hartford Memorial that transferred here to Upper Chesapeake, uh, where um, he was placed in the hospital service. Um, his past medical history, uh, he has a history of ankylosing spondylitis, which is known insulin dependent diabetes, cardiomyopathy, ejection fraction 20%, history of a melanoma with a, a resection of his back, which was very close to the incision, by the way, history of stroke in the past, CVA, nephrolithiasis, right rotator cuff repair, left hallux amputation due to infection. So that gives you an idea that his diabetes is not perfectly controlled. Uh, chronic low back pain for which he takes a methadone 40 milligrams a day and an L405 discectomy in the past and a left total hip arthroplasty. He's six feet tall, 305 pounds. So, any other questions about the patient so far? Good morning, Alan. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Alan, 59 year old man with mid thoracic back pain, multiple medical problems. Good morning, David. Um, hip, history of slip and fall, unable to walk. He has many medical problems diabetes, cardiomyopathy. Um, so, Aaron, what do you see on the x rays here? Do you see anything? Not much, really, at all except for one area, which may be a step off. Um, hip um, Here you go, Aaron, Aaron. Yeah. That way you don't have to exercise today. 20%. Is that low? Yeah, yeah. It's very low. Yeah, it's low, I know, he's walking, yeah. He's, he's sick, man, medical problems. You see, there's a step off here in the x-ray, but the x-rays are very poor. But luckily, everybody in the emergency room gets a CAT scan um, to evaluate things. And um, what do you see on the CAT scan, Aaron? Point. Mm -hmm. So it's an obvious fracture, right? Uh, uh, through the, looks like a disc space. And... Um, you see elsewhere in the back posteriorly yeah right through and through so it's a it's a fracture uh, of the spine so there's a couple of things he has ankylosing spondylitis and he has a fracture now there's only when you say those two words together ankylosing spondylitis and fracture when you say them to me it's a serious serious problem you say it to anybody else they're like so what but you say it to me it's a serious serious problem because i know that Anybody with ankylosing spondylitis, if they have a fracture, it's most likely a very serious problem. And it's because the whole the whole bone is fused commonly in ankylosing spondylitis, the entire the entire spine. So, and in the middle of this spine is a spinal cord. So you can imagine if it's like a femur and it's broken through and through, it's shifting and the spinal cord is in the middle. So it's very, very dangerous. Uh, but no one else understands this seriousness, unfortunately. Some ER doctors do, but... Uh, it, it's missed very commonly. Serious enough. Maybe because it's a rare disease. I don't know. So Go back to the regular x-ray. Do you see anything? Well, there's one area. Maybe. I'm not sure. Oh, that article was nice. Which one? The <coughs> fracture one? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, it's written by orthopedic surgeons, so we take these things very seriously because ultimately we're responsible, yeah, for the sequelae. So if you look at this man's um, sacroiliac joint, can you see it? No, it's fused completely. Um, and these are some coronal sections which show um, on the right, Aaron Strom, the fracture through and through. So so he, he basically, this man would move would not get out of bed could, just because of the pain. They tried to get him up and nothing. So he was basically broken in half. He's got, a, he's got a complete fracture of his spine separating the top part of his body from the bottom part of his body. So it's a very, very serious injury. So this man has, um, and if you guys have any questions, just interrupt me. This man, man has ankylosing spondylitis, and there's a lot of other ways to describe this. Uh, uh, rheumatoid spondylosis, rheumatoid arthritis of the spine, uh, but most people call it uh, ankylosing spondylitis. And so he's, so he's 59 is not very old. And that's a very good point that you say, uh, is this guy young? Uh, there's a couple of things about ankylosing spondylitis. Ankylosing spondylitis is a disease of youth. So young people get this, this thing. And from the time that it starts, to this point where you see the whole spine's fused, takes about 10 years. So um, he's about right, actually. It usually starts around 40, and usually people's spines are fused around 50, maybe mid-50s, so he's 59 years old. So he's very, very typical for ankylosing spondylitis. Yeah, he's in the right range. Um, this is a good question. So this guy has a fracture through and through. So I tried to put him into the... Um, MRI scanner to see if he has an epidural hematoma because it'll change my it'll change my surgery. If he does not have an epidural hematoma, I'm not going to decompress him. If he does have an epidural hematoma, well, I have to decompress him to take the uh, quad out. He could not fit in it. We tried a couple of times. We tried to open. Impossible. So uh, uh, I had to take him to surgery. The other, the other problem with him with surgery is that he's 300 pounds. He's a huge man. And I could not find the fracture on the x-ray. It was very, very difficult even to count the vertebral bodies because of his body habitus. So it was very difficult. So basically, I had to do the thing blind, and I had to open him up and find the fracture, basically, just obviously my best guess. And the fracture wasn't where I expected it to be, but I did find it. So the basic premise is um, I fix these like a femur, uh, four points above, four points below. Some people say six points above, six points below. Um, to stabilize the fracture. If you don't stabilize it, first of all, he can't walk. He literally couldn't walk due to the pain. And then you do risk also neurological injury. He could be, com he could be uh, paralyzed as a result of this uh, problem by the instability. So you, you need pedicle screws above, pedicle screws below. And I also did a um, uh, laminectomy at the level of the um, uh, fracture. And we did find the hematoma and pressure on the spinal cord, and we removed that. So that was basically his surgery. And um, uh, sorry, guys. And this is uh, the x ray post op, so you get an understanding of four screws above, four screws below. And uh, we found the fracture. You can see the fracture um, on, the, on the side view. And um, the other thing is, uh, you see, it's not, I, I, it's not reduced, it's crooked. And so basically, can anybody guess why it's non reduced? Any, any guesses from the table, right? His weight, yeah. So you can see the arrows. Those are the arrows of pressure. There's a there's a there's a post on the chest and there's a post on the hips because the person's got to lay somewhere, and and the belly's free. That's how our spine tables are. And because of those pressures, it deformed the spine. Um, it would it's impossible to reduce this thing. Uh, it, it would be very difficult. You, know, you could maybe do it through the instrumentation and, and contour the rod, but it's very difficult. So basically, I accept the um, Except the deformity. And Aaron, show them where the laminectomy was up higher. So that's that's where the fracture exited the backside. So it's pretty close, but not exactly where the other one was. So it kind of breaks, you know, like a fi like a fibula or a femur sometimes, it breaks like a spiral. Uh, it broke up a little bit higher. So that's just the post top. And you see his whole spine his, his whole spine is completely fused. And these are just sorry, yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, they're they're it's it's pretty aligned. You're just seeing you're just seeing different views of the spine. 
because it's curved in another plane. Um, but people can have deformities. And these are just post-op x-rays. You can see the screws. This screw on the right was just slightly lateral to perfect position, but it was acceptable. Um, and um, the other screws. So so any any questions about this case? And the, and the man, believe it or not, the next day, he said, my back feels better. And, and he got up out of bed, even though he had this big operation. So you, you can imagine people really... Um, really benefit from it. Right, Aaron? I mean, you're impressed, weren't you? Yeah. They do. They, they have a serious problem. And once you fix it, they're very, very happy with you. Yes. Yes. They get, yes, they get osteoporosis. They do. Yeah, it's very weak. And, and I think it's because of the abnormal fo forces to the spine because the whole thing is fused in one big bone. And it just it just the outside becomes a shell and the inside becomes cancellous. It it, it looks like more like a tibia. Mm -hmm. So that's what happens to these people. Are they only are they only able to bend through their hips then? <clears throat> their whole spine. Yeah, they only bend through their hips and their hips get arthritic too. Actually. So um so uh, so epidemiology, it's, it's more men than women, uh, two for one, maybe one or two in a thousand in North America. You never find them in Aborigines. And um, the, the disease is progressive. You can see this man on the bottom. This is the classic uh, photo. Um, maybe 1% of the population in the world. Now you can, you can put these, group these uh, diseases, ankylosing spondylitis, into what's called seronegative spondyloarthropathy. Uh, so these are people who are negative to rheumatoid factor and to, and I learned this for the first time, I'm embarrassed, anti-CCP factor, which is, I had to look it up, cyclic citrullinated peptide, which is another uh, marker for um, uh, uh, like rheumatoid disease. But other disease processes similar to this, which are seronegative, are um, reactive arthritis, psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease like um, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's. Um, and, and, and these, I think these diseases go across each other too. There's, uh, they're, they're similar. The radiographic features of ankylosing spondylitis is the vertebral bodies are square. They have bridging syndesmophytes. So basically the ligaments that, col that connect the spine ossify. Um, and it, when it's a mature uh, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, it looks like bamboo. And they call it bamboo spine. So here's just a typical... Uh, ankylosing spondylitis. Sacroiliac joints are totally fused, and the spine is fused up and down completely. And everything that connects the spine, one bone from another, ossifies. So the discs ossify, the anterior longitude locks, all the ligaments totally ossify. So the thing is about ankylosing spondylitis, which I find interesting, is that it, it, it doesn't go from zero to one. There's a continuum of when people get this disease. And when people, when young people very often come to the office and say they have low back pain and they have totally normal MRI. And we tell them you're normal and they get furious at us. And um, they're not normal. I try to tell them they're not normal, but you don't have a surgical problem. You have some kind of medical problem. And probably most of these people have ankylosing spondylitis, I bet you. Um, and they're just early. So the early clinical features are uh, a normal MRI and they're less than 45 years of age. So they're young people. And the MRI looks normal, um, but they have an inflammatory back pain. And the way to describe inflammatory back pain, people say it's insidious, it's dull, it migrates, it's in, his in the lower back, in the buttocks, in the pelvis. It's more than three months. It's not just a, a short duration thing. It improves with exercise and it's worse with rest. So that's the difference. It's different from uh, arthritic problems is like whenever you lift weights or whenever you run, your back hurts. It's the opposite in ankylosing spondylitis. Um, they get pain in the middle of the night too, and usually it's the second half of, of at nighttime. They wake up and they have pain because they have stiffness. They have to get up and walk around. They also have morning stiffness more than just 30 minutes, and they respond very well to NSAIDs. So if you have those things, you're you know it's a, there's a good chance you have ankylosing spondylitis. Again, it's it's a disease of young people less than 45 years of age, and other things that you can get are dactylitis. Uveitis, which I'm sure if you get it, you're very scared. Um, strong family history, 15, 20%. Uh, people are HLA B27 positive. We'll get into that more. They get sacroiliitis. 
They can have proximal aortic disease, aortitis, inflammatory bowel disease, pulmonary fibrosis. So HLA B27, what is that? It's, it's on the antigen presenting cells of our body. So 90% of patients with ankylosing spondylitis have this, but uh, it's also common in the population, like 8% of the population has this as well. Um, so who has, who's HLA B27 positive? In healthy white people, it's eight percent. African Americans, four percent. If you're ankylosing spondylitis, ninety-two percent chance you have it, but it's less in African Americans, interestingly. But this is—it's also positive in reactive arthritis, uh, psoriasis, and other <laughs> negative inflammatory arthropathy. So this is this is just a schematic of HLA B27 and how it works in the um, antigen prevent uh, antigen presenting cell. But don't ask me. Don't ask me what this is. <laughs> Um, so one way to measure stiffness clinically is a Chauvers test where you, where you measure um, across the top of the pelvis, 10 centimeters above and five below, measure that, and then ask them to bend forwards. And the skin should stretch five centimeters in a normal person because the spine's flexible. But if the <coughs> spine's very stiff, it doesn't stretch at all. So it's, that's just a classic clinical test you can do. And the other thing is rib expansion. So when people take a deep breath, their ribs expand. Uh, if, if it doesn't expand, there's a good chance you have ankylosing spondylitis, less than 2.5 centimeters. The other thing I, I like to do as well to measure the deformity is tell them to put their, he, their, their heels, their buttocks, and the back of their head against the door. Commonly, ankylosing spondylitis patients cannot do that. Um, and it, the, the worse it is, it's, it's the worse the deformity. And if it gets very bad, you can't, you can't see the horizon. Um, this can be prevented by exercises. So if people with ankylosing spondylitis vigorously exercise in extension, they can be fused straight. And then they're functional. Mm -hmm. They're not looking at their shoes, so to speak, like uh, the person in A. But, but it's, it's difficult, though. So how do you make a diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis? The classic criteria, the New York criteria, criteria which is um, you have to have one clinical um, sign say low back, uh, inflammatory low back pain, stiffness, uh, chest expansion stiffness, and radiographic finds of sacroiliitis. So this is a, a normal sacroiliac joint. And these are different diseased sacroiliac joints. B is totally fused. A is almost normal. And it, it, it's, um, it's a progressively worsening disease. It's difficult to diagnose by x-ray. It, um, now, how can you diagnose it better? MRI is a lot better. Um, and you can see the uh, inflammation of the sacred iliac joint a lot better on MRI. The problem is you have to tell the radiologist what you're looking for, for them to understand what to find, because they may just call it normal. Um, now, who gets sacred iliitis? All these people get sacred iliitis, so uh, it's not specific for ankylosing spondylitis. Now, there's a, I, now I'm also embarrassed to to say this, but I didn't know about this society, but there's a there's an ASAS, Assessment of Spondyl Arthritis International Society, which is sort of new, and they came up with a new way to diagnose ankylosing spondylitis. Start, it started in 2009, and it's um, I think it, it catches people earlier in the disease process. So basically, you have to have inflammatory back disease, which is three months of pain in a young person, and either sacroiliitis in two clinical features or your HLA B27 with two clinical features. So you can still get the diagnosis without sacroiliitis. Uh, and they found this to be a very good test. And there, there's the, if you want to look it up, there's the um, reference. So if you're a, um, sorry, if you're a uh, algorithm guy, um, this is an algorithm you can use um, how to make the diagnosis. But the, I think the basic premise is if you're HLA B27 or not, if you have sacroiliitis or not, and as you can see, they all go down to MRI. Basically, you make the diagnosis with an MRI of the sacroiliac joint. Um, in general, when you have axial spondyloarthritis, to go to ankylosing spondylitis takes about 10 years. So it's, it's, I think it's beneficial to people, to patients, to make the diagnosis because you can send them to treatment. And what's the treatment? The first line treatment is NSAIDs. So on the left are all the different NSAIDs that are 
many of the NSAIDs that are available. Like, what's your, Brian, what's your favorite NSAID? Uh, naproxen. Naproxen? Yeah, that used to be my favorite. My favorite now is meloxicam, Mobic. But I mean, and all of these are, are just as effective as uh, you know, other ones. They're just a little different. And then the second line treatment are tumor TNF inhibitors um, or tumor necrosis factor inhibitors, which are very, very effective um, to slowing down this disease process. The problem is there's there are risk factors to that medicine. Uh, sure. And contraindications are infection, tuberculosis, heart failure, lupus, multiple sclerosis, cancer. It can make those disease processes worse. So they're very effective to slowing down the disease, but they have they have risks and they have side effects too. The, the, the medical treatment for ankylosing spondylitis. So any questions so far about medical treatment? Th this obviously is outside of my um, my circle of competence. Other treat steroids does not help. Methotrexate does not help. And bisphosphonates help some with the osteoporosis. So. The other issue about ankylosing spondylitis, like we said, the fractures are commonly missed and the diagnosis is very commonly delayed. So this is just an x-ray and MRI. And you look at the MRI, it just looks weird. That, that, doesn't, that MRI scan does not scream fracture. The people, they, the, the, the radiologists say it's an infection. It's a, they, they don't even know what it is. The, the MRI is unusual. Sometimes the, M, the, X, the CAS scan, though, is, is the way to make this diagnosis. So who, fractures... 1% of all people with ankylosing spondylitis get a fracture. And when they get a fracture, it's usually cervical uh, and, then, and then less likely thoracic lumbar. And 8% of the time, they have multiple fractures, which I've never seen before. Whenever I've seen ankylosing spondylitis, and I've maybe seen like 10 cases in my career, it's always been just one fracture, but maybe I haven't seen enough. So this is a, I like to show a different case. This is another case about five years ago, a 56 year old man Again, mid-50s, which is interesting because that's when they're totally um, consolidated. And why not mid-60s and mid-70s? Does anybody have a guess? I have a, I have a guess. Maybe. I mean, I have no idea. I'm just guessing. Maybe. My, my guess is people are more active in their 50s than they are in their 60s and 70s. So I think 50-year-olds, they think, they think they're 30, so <clears throat> they're more active. Maybe. I don't know. So 56-year-old, and he had chronic mid-thoracic back pain. He had pain for three months that was severe. He failed physical therapy, NSAIDs, a brace, and the MRI finding was possible infection. So you can see, here's the x-ray. Aaron, can you see the fracture on the lateral? You've got the pointer. That's why I'm picking on you. Yeah, right there. It's a sharp angle, isn't it? So this guy, this guy the whole time had a fracture, and it was undiagnosed. And he was being treated like he had normal back pain. He's had total hip replacements. And 30% of patients with ankylosing spondylitis have hip arthritis. And 8% of them get a um, total hip replacement. He's, he's obviously totally fused. And you can see the MRI looks weird, right? It looks like there's edema there. It's, it's, it's hard to understand. Is it an infection? It's not clear. But when you look at the CAT scan, it's very, very clear what's wrong. So when I saw this patient in the office, he just had an MRI uh, and an X-ray. And the first thing I did was order a CAT scan, which just clearly shows a fracture. Um, and here's the coronal section, which you can see the fracture again. And again, the, the MRI looks like it looks like an infection. So he was sent to infectious disease for possible discitis. And you can see here both anteriorly and posterior. You can see the fracture in the posterior side. And this this is uh, the, um, intraoperatively. I opened them up and you can see, can you guys see the crack where the fracture is on the backside? You can always find the fracture on the backside too. It's, it's a through and through fracture. So this is another, another case where I did a um, four points above, four points below. And this man, as same as the last guy, immediately, next day after the surgery, he thanked me. He said, thank you so much for fixing my back. I feel better, which, you know, it's rare to get that. But, I get it. It's just all one column. All, all three, I mean, it's all one unit, so all three columns are like, Yeah, through and through, which is a serious injury, yeah. It's a very, very serious injury. And it's very unstable. You can imagine it can shift. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have one more case. Do you have any questions about that case?
Well, I think if you have a patient with ankylosing spondylitis in pain, you have to make sure they don't have a fracture. Yeah, well, you have to be very, very careful with these people. They're, they're very brittle people. Yes. Yes, which is different than most times. I mean, usually a CAT scan is not as good uh, of a test as MRI. Okay, so I have one more case, which is the most interesting case. And also, this is, this is an interesting case because uh, it's an old one. You can see the year 1998. And this was uh, my first year in practice. And... Whenever you meet an old doctor, they always tell you um, first year in practice and they're usually horror stories. And I don't know why, but I'm one of these old doctors now that tells you the first year in practice. And the other interesting fact is these are slides, Kodachrome slides that I took back then. It's the first time that now that the iPhone is powerful enough where all I had to do is put these slides up against the x-ray board and take a picture with my iPhone. So this is sort of like, I credit Apple and the magic of the iPhone for bringing these slides back to life. So this was an interesting case. I was at GW at the time. And anytime someone would refer me a case, I'd say, yeah, sure, ship it. I don't, you know, I'm like, I'm a young guy. I'll take anything, anything. So this patient was 60 and she was at a, a community hospital. She had an ACDF that the, basically the referring orthopedic surgeon said, I did an anterior cervical fusion for this patient and it didn't help. Can you accept the transfer? I was like, oh, okay. So, <laughs> so patient came and uh, sure enough, she did have anterior cervical fusion, C5, C6, but nowhere in the documentation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Nowhere in the documentation was the fact that um, she had ankylosing spondylitis. So it was undiagnosed. And basically, she never had a CAT scan. Same story. She had an MRI in 19, and even in 1998. So um, she was C5 uh, quadriplegic. Um, and she was, uh, she was progressively getting worse following the surgery. Um, she was not, when I saw her, she wasn't walking. She had uh, very little uh, motion of her legs. And uh, she was at a C5 um, fusion. Now, she had the surgery, I think, three weeks prior to I saw her. When I talked to her and got a good history, um, I got a history of an emergency intubation two months prior to this, uh, the surgery. So basically, she had some kind of respiratory problem, and uh, she couldn't breathe, and she was, had emergency intubation. So what, exactly, exactly. So basically these people's necks are down. They have like chin to chest deformity and you can't intubate somebody when their head's like that. So the first thing the anesthesiologists do is they lift the chin up. So what probably some, someone do some, someone in the emergency room, they lifted this patient's chin emergently to save her life, obviously not to cause harm. And that motion broke her neck and it went undiagnosed. Um, yeah, you're talking to sort of put the head in that slip and you know, it's better. It's better, yeah. Good. Yeah, but think about it. I mean, it's an emergency, so yeah. they're they're thinking airway saved the patient's life. So, um, good morning, hey Doug. So, Aaron, I just wanted to just review. So, so like two months prior, she had a, an emergency inter, um, intubation, and I think during that emergency intubation, they broke her neck at C5. Um, so here's the MRI scan. And sorry about its poor quality, but you can see Aaron point where the problem is. You can see there's something posterior there compressing the spinal cord. And you can see the spine is not aligned. It's extended. And guess, Aaron, why is it extended? Did the doctor do that? Why, why is it malformed in an extended position? Can you guess? Hold on, let me show you a CAT scan. So here's a CAT scan. This is an old CAT scan, sorry about the quality, but you can see the back, the arrows point to the back of C6 and then the back of C7. The spine is 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 shifted and extended. Can anybody guess why? Why had that happen? How'd the neck get, why was it fused in that position? I'll just tell you, ACDF is done in a supine position, right? So the patient's on their back and the head goes backwards. So gravity is pulling the head backwards. So it, it caused a deformity. So the surgeon just, you know, did the wrong surgery, basically. Did an anterior cervical fusion for someone with ankylosing spondylitis. They should have realized this would have happened. But I don't think the doctor never knew it was ankylosing spondylitis anyway. Um, and and it, was, uh, it was fused in, a, in the incorrect position. 
So what I did it, what I did back then is something very simple. I just took the plate out and I, I put her in a halo and I put her in a flex position. I put her back where she used to be before they broke her neck. Um, and then I also, just to be sure everything's okay, I got a post-op CT myelogram. And you can see at the very bottom, and I'm showing at the bottom where the bone graft is, you see the spinal cord now has plenty of room. So basically, if you put people, if you, if you treat these patients, you have to put them, you should probably put them back where they were. Otherwise, you can compress the spinal cord, uh, unless you do like an osteotomy or something complicated. So I thought this was a very interesting case. And she recovered, actually. She, she walked. When she, six months after the surgery, she was walking, which uh, with a walker, but still, that's better than uh, nothing. She, she was very thankful, actually. She was from West Virginia, yeah. She's, she's very, very thankful. Nice, nice people. What plate did you go through? So I removed the plate, and then I just put a halo on. I put one of these things on. So basically, it's, it looks crazy, but it's just a couple pins yeah. in the skull. And connects to a vest. It's a pretty safe procedure. It's not a big deal. It just holds everything still until it heals up. And then this is the best, this is the, the best, simplest, best treatment for fractures of the cervical spine with ankylosing spondylitis. I've done it many times. Very simple, <clears throat> um, very low risk. Um, otherwise, you'd have to do it like a circumferential fusion, which is a big surgery. I guess like for as long as they'll let you, three months. Heal very well, very well, yeah. So the 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 the, the disease process fuses. <laughs> yeah, it's a long time. Well, not not always. I uh I did this on a judge. He went back. He went back to being a judge the next day. I mean, it what, depends on who you are. On yeah, with a halo. Yeah, he's putting, he's putting people in jail with a halo. Can you imagine how terrified <laughs> everybody was? <laughs> Can you imagine that skydiving with a halo? He was healed, probably. It's time to take the halo off. Yeah, so this is just... um. This is just one last thing I, I just want to show. Is, this is a case of st spondylodiscitis. I don't have a case of my own. I just found this on the internet. I've only seen it once in practice. So basically, this is a case of a non-union. So some patients have like a tiny fracture, uh, and it was treated non-operatively, and it never heals. And then it becomes like a shark co-joint. It just keeps trying to heal, and you have this big uh, ossified. I've seen I've seen it once when I was in practice uh, uh, when I was at GBMC. The guy had it for ten years. And he says he didn't want it fixed. He's fine. He can deal with it. And it's just a smoldering non-union of the spine, which is very interesting. I think. Um, and people can get that too. Next, and um, I won't get into this. And that's it. So, any questions about ankylosing spondylitis? We saw a couple of interesting cases. Yeah, seronegative spondyloarthropathy. Yeah. I I have some other questions for you. Not yeah. To that. Yeah. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on this like risk factor phenomenon at the cervical? Um, in that case, I showed. Right there. Uh, no, this is just in the other patient. Drift back the... phenomena. So, go ahead. Tell me what you're talking about. Like recurrence no. of deformities. No, after after repair. The... Spine. Oh, the spinal cord shifting back. back yeah. Yeah. Neurologically. Yeah. Like okay. Procedure. I'll tell you how this works. So when you do a laminoplasty or a laminectomy, by the way, for stenosis, the spinal cord opens up and it drifts backwards just because that's where it's going to go. It's the, where the brain is, where the rest is. The, the spinal cord drifts backwards. So the spinal cord, every centimeter has a nerve coming off, right? Every centimeter. So when it drifts backwards, you can imagine when it drifts backwards, the nerves get tighter because the nerves are connected to the arms. Yeah, so it stretches. So C5 is dead center in the middle of the spinal cord. That stretches the most. It moves the farthest. 
So what happens is when the spinal cord drifts back, it stretches on the C5 nerve root the most. And that's why people get a C5 palsy. You see what I mean? Yeah, but why would it stretch in the first place? Because it's moving. Because the spinal cord moves. Because it's now it's decompressed and it shifts. It, it, okay. it basically it goes somewhere else. Okay. Did I explain it? Yeah. Yeah. When you do in the surgery, when you do a laminectomy, you see the spinal cord drifts backwards. And you know, oh, now the spinal cord's got more room, mm -hmm. and you know you're happy. But that that shifting pulls on a nerve root. What, what, what is the, what is the term? What is the term spinoplasty? Spinoplasty. Spinoplasty. Yeah, that came up. I don't know. Oh my question. 